Good morning. He was a doctor with a background from Sudan. But on this specific day, he had some leisure time and he was playing football. He and another player suddenly ran into each other. It was quite a bad collision. The day after, he felt severe pain. Once the ambulance arrived, he had already vomited and fainted. The nurse, who checked his condition, later wrote in the journal that the man that was lying unconscious on the floor was only pretending. He called it a cultural fainting. The man did not get the quick attendance he should have had with what later turned out to be a cerebral hemorrhage. Later he died. This is one of many cases during the last years in Sweden where the effects of prejudice and discrimination becomes crystal clear on the individual level. The right to non-discrimination is the absolute core of all human rights law. It is not only a right itself, but also a core principle that constitutes the fundament for access and fulfillment of all other rights. The freedom of movement, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of association, equality in front of the law, the right to a fair trial, the right to work, the right to housing, the right to education, the right to health, the right to culture, and as in the example I just mentioned, the core right to life itself. The European Union has in place an advanced legal framework with which to promote equal access to fundamental rights and non-discrimination. All 27 EU member states has transposed this legal framework into national law, often going beyond the minimum standards, including in the Racial Equality Directive and the Employment Equality Directive. But mere legal protection is not enough. Without accurate and comparable data, it is difficult to assess the scale and the nature of discrimination suffered by different groups. It is difficult to create effective policies and tools to combat inequality. So I am very happy this morning uh, to be able to be here and welcome you to this conference on equality data as a tool for combating discrimination. A conference arranged by the Swedish Equality Ombudsman, now when Sweden is very proud to have the presidency of the Council of the European Union. My name is Hanna Gerdes, I'm a Swedish human rights lawyer, and today I've been given the task to moderate this important conference. Ways of measuring and capturing structural discrimination has been a hot topic during at least the 25 years that I've been working on anti-discrimination. Uh, both internationally, within academia, and within civil society and private businesses. And equality data has been discussed for very many years. I remember uh, almost 20 years ago when uh, one of the organizations that I was a manager of, the Bureau Against Discrimination in Östergötland, I don't know if you're here today, I think somebody, ah, I'm very happy to see somebody from there, uh, did one of the first situation testings in Sweden to try to prove structural discrimination through some kind of statistics. The Bureau at that time sent over 50 applications to different administrative jobs with almost identical CVs with a small difference, with one of the applicants actually having a visual impairment to try to prove structural discrimination. The result? The person without disability was asked to 14 interviews. The person with a disability was asked only to three. Today we have come quite some way enhancing these early methods, but there is still a lot to be done. And that is also why this conference is so important. 
I also do believe that this is actually the first time in Sweden that this kind of big conference, international conference, on equality data is arranged by the official Swedish Equal Treatment Authority. And it's about time, wouldn't you say? Well, first of all, um, I want to ask all of you, because this is a long conference and we're going to be listening to a lot of experts and interesting speakers, but I mean, we're a lot of people in here as well. Couldn't you just start off with saying hello to the person sitting next to you? <laughs> Hi. So I'm happy. I saw you took the initiative also to say hi to people behind you and in front of you. I'm very happy about that. Um, and you will have much more time to speak with each other, of course, during the breaks and lunch and intermissions of different kinds. Um, today you will have the opportunity to listen to many different experts within this field and to exchange thoughts and to discuss also with each other. Um, this conference will focus on the significance of equality data on, uh, when combating discrimination in society and what kind of contribution equality data can make to individuals obtaining redress. The conference will also shine light on the challenges that are present in the work to, ca to gather, compile and use equality data to combat discrimination. And the aim of the conference uh, from the Discrimination Ombudsman is to allow a reflective approach and to lift different perspectives, opinions and methods regarding equality data. I also want to mention that this conference is a live uh, conference, so most interactive moments will be present here in the room. But for all of you who are joining us also online, I want to say hello. Uh, this uh, conference is also being streamed. And I want to say also, of course, warm welcome to you all that are joining us online right now. Um, there will be a pho photographer in here in the break. So in case any of you don't want to be on a photo, please uh, be clear on that. So uh, to the phot photographer that will be walking around. Um, we will have several breaks during the day. There will be a lunch. Uh, the lunch will be just outside of the conference room. Uh, the breaks, uh, coffee breaks will be one stair uh, up. There are several toilets uh, outside of the room and also upstairs. Uh, and I was also asked to say that if you want to evacuate or if we have to evacuate rather, <laughs> if you want to evacuate, that's not very bad. <laughs> okay, sorry. Well, there is uh, four doors here that you can go through. Um, and for all of you who are joining us live, there will be a possibility to pose questions to our different guests. Uh, but since we are quite a lot of people and since we're streaming this as well, we would like to ask you to do this writtenly. So there will be uh, three people. We're going to... Michelle, can you just... There is Michelle. Hi. Uh, and Ulrika. Uh, Ulrika is in the back. And Katarina. Are you Katarina? Ah, there is Katarina. Uh, they will be going around uh, with the little bowls that you see over there, uh, or there are three bowls over there, and they will be walking around and they will be um, collecting questions. And we will try to pose as many of those questions as possible in the end of every session to the experts. And you have gotten bags on your seats. And in these bags, you will find pen and paper. Uh, so we will go around and collect your questions and you can write uh, your questions on, um, on the paper that's in the back. You can write them in Swedish or you can write them in English. Um, I can't promise we will be able to translate any other language that you will use, but we will try. So please write it in any language that you want and we will do our best, but preferably English or Swedish. And now I w it's uh, become time to introduce a key person for making this conference possible and who wants to say an official warm welcome to all of you, the Swedish Equality Ombudsman, Lars Arrhenius. So, welcome up, Lars. Thank you. Uh, distinguished speakers and participants, I woke up this morning uh, from a nightmare, and the nightmare was about missing this event because the alarm clock didn't call. So, I'm happy that it's just a dream. So, uh, first of all, I would like to 
thank you for being here today and attending this conference. And I hope uh, today's uh, presentations and discussions will enable reflective and inspiring dialogues on this issue, on the role of equality data in combating discrimination. A complex issue that is highly topical. Yeah, I am very pleased to see uh, such a variety of guests from different EU member states. A total of 31 countries and 135 different organizations. Isn't that worth an applaud? <laughs> Uh, I will also try express uh, a special warm welcome uh, to the representatives from the Ukrainian Ombudsman. Uh, Maria Ushapiska, maybe you can stand up. Uh, Mikhailo Spasov and Yulia Petrova. In spite of the circumstances, you managed to come here and I'm very happy for that. Thank you very much. Uh, the Swedish Equality Ombudsman works in various ways to combat discrimination and promote equal rights and opportunities for all. We are an independent government agency which is safeguarded uh, by the fact that our basic mandate is uh, is in the safeguard by the fact that our basic mandate and responsibilities is governed by law. Our key focus is centered around seeking redress for individuals that have suffered uh, from discrimination. Concretely, this means receiving and considering reported cases of discrimination. We receive complaints, we are conducting investigations, taking supervisory decisions and pursuing individual cases of discrimination. A key focus of our work is to contribute to legal protection from discrimination and holding the duty bearers accountable for committed infringements of the Discrimination Act. And we do this in tandem with the promotion work. Our promotion work is centered around increasing awareness and knowledge about the prevalence of discrimination in Sweden and to educate and engage in dialogues with various stakeholders. We conduct regular dialogues with both rights holders and duty bearers to enhance knowledge about the legal protection against discrimination. Though it is yet our exchanges with the rights holders, the civil society, civil society organizations that we focus on in this regard. Through our dialogues with civil society, we are not only reaching out to those who are or risk being discriminated against, we are also acquiring indispensable insights and knowledge about experiences of discrimination in the society. These mutual exchanges, where we both listen and learn, as well as inform about rights and the legal protection against discrimination, are really important for us. Discrimination and intolerance should be addressed but by various means and at all levels in society, from individual to structural levels. It is essential as these all are interlinked. With our different actions, putting the individual at the center of our work, we seek to contribute to a broader change in society. We see that the link between justice accountability and a sound knowledge base are interconnected and can be mutually reinforced. Collectively, these can address and enlighten on root causes of discrimination and intolerance and on structures that uphold these. We are aware that the occurrence of discrimination is widespread in society, in Europe, and Sweden is no exception. Yet, there are regrettably those that would contest this statement. Equality data is an important source of information about the occurrence of discrimination in society. The better informed we are on the extent of discrimination and on obstacles to equal rights and opportunities, the better equipped we are to properly tackle these issues. Equality data has the potential to disclose on the scale and nature of discrimination and prove how marginalized groups are exposed and affected. 
with such information and with a common understanding of the extent of discrimination, we also have higher chances to better prevent and combat discrimination, including to revise or adapt strategies and policies. The positive spin effect and impact equality data can have towards a more equitable society is significant. We see that the potential equality data has in disclosing the prevalence of discrimination and prejudice. However, I must also highlight the other side of the coin. There are several challenges linked to the collection and use of equality data, particular data on ethnicity and race. And if this are not taken into account and remedied properly, the outcome may rather be counterproductive or misleading. According to the principles of do not harm, we first need to safeguard from doing any harm before doing any good. We are of the firm view that the prerequisite for a safe collection, registration and processing of equality data is that it's conducted in a way that ensures the protection of personal integrity and maintains the basic principles of anonymity, voluntarism, self-identification and self-classification. I also see that it's of a great importance that the nature of the issue should guide the choice of method. The selected methodology in collection of information and data should also be done in consultation with the affected group and groups. This is vital to prevent equality data from reproducing or contributing to categorizations of groups and identities, hence with risk of maintaining bias and stereotypes. I would like to make a point on the importance of collecting data based in, on different sources. In our view, it's essential that the quality data is based on a wide range of sources, such as on complaints of discrimination, legal decisions, reports, service and dialogues. We see, for instance, that our dialogues with civil society organizations are a central source for information about the experiences of discrimination. Through these dialogues, we can acquire a deeper understanding of lived and experienced discrimination and of unequal access to fundamental rights. We must also uh, recognize that the attitudes towards collecting, registering and processing data based on grounds of discrimination varies greatly between different groups. There are groups that strongly oppose the collection of data, given the risk of misuse. With this in mind, I would once again like to repeat the importance of protecting the personal integrity when collecting data. Similarly, that data is gathered in consultation with the affected groups. This is important because fixed definitions, classifications and categorizations may not correspond, correspond to their lived reality. It takes great courage to disclose experience of discrimination. For us as an equality body with a mission to support and seek readers for individuals that have suffered discrimination, it is an absolute necessity for us that individuals and groups have trust in our agency. Today at this conference, uh, the Swedish Equality Ombudsman has the pleasure to launch our first, what will become annual reports of the state of discrimination in Sweden. And it's part of our efforts to disclose on the extent of discrimination in our society, to prevent and combat discrimination, as well as promote equal rights and opportunities for all. Uh, I shall not reveal too much about this first report on the state of discrimination in Sweden. It will be presented more in detail shortly by my colleague. So to conclude my opening remarks, if equality data indeed is recognized to have a multi-dimensional sides and there is not the one fits all approach to gathering information, then I think equality data has the great potential to disclose on the widespread discrimination and unequal access to rights in our society. And I think we need more research and evidence to show how the circumstances really are, both at an individual level and also the structural level. 
In doing so, uh, we also need concrete measures to safeguard from doing any harm, to retain trust, and to deliver on what we say. So let me take this opportunity to once again thank you, everyone participating at the conference today, sharing your different perspectives and experiences. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to constructive dialogues and hearing from you, points, your points of view and experiences. Thank you. Hi, Lars. Hi. <laughs> I'm happy you stayed up here because I have some questions for you. Um, you mentioned 135 organizations. That's a lot. Um, you also mentioned the dialogue with civil society and that it's a key element in collecting data, but also for you as an ombudsman. Uh, can you tell me a little bit? How do you work with this today? Yeah, well, but I was appointed as the, the, the ombudsman uh, in December 2020. Uh, for me, it, uh, the dialogue with the civil society was very important uh, when I took this work as an ombudsman. And my background is also that, that I've been in civil society organizations a lot. So I, can, I saw that it's a lot of competence, it's a lot of, of, of information. So for us at the Ombudsman, it's a, it's a very important resource and, and, and source of information. So for us, we have, we have on a regular base that we meet different social civil society organizations, and we also do that in different uh, projects and, and assignments. And I can mention one, one, one example um, as a part of a report to, uh, to the government of discrimination connected to religion or faith. Faith. We met around 60 different groups and, and, and organizations representing different religions. And that was so important for us because on that background we could give recommendations to the government and, uh, and, and conclusions. So it was very vital for us. And have you been working also in this report that you're launching, uh, yeah, that you launched yesterday? You've been working a lot with civil society? Absolutely. That has been a very important thing when we launched, when we made this report. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you another thing. Um, equality data, I mean, it's not uh, one specific model, but it's defined as a, any piece of information that is useful for the purpose of describing and analyzing the state of equality. Um, and this, I mean, this kind of information is important, but still it seems to be such a difficult subject uh, to discuss sometimes because it has so many dimensions. So what do you look forward to most today? with all the discussions and all the experts that are coming. Yeah, uh, uh, as you heard, we launched our first report. Uh, in fact, it was yesterday we launched it, and this it was the first report uh, on this uh, more overlooking uh, according, uh, about discrimination in Sweden. And so this is the first time we do it. We're going to do it annually uh, next year. So for me, it's very for me, it's important to, to listen to different uh, perspectives in this area because I know a lot of people here working for many years with this area. So I'm, 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 I, I want to learn. <laughs> okay. So thank you for taking the initiative and inviting us. Thank, thank you. Let's. Thank you. Let's, uh, your uh, and now I would like to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Rosemary Kayes. And Rosemary, for those who don't know her, is the chairperson of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. So I'm very happy to have Rosemary with us digitally today. So I'm going to hand over to the screen. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the Swedish Equality Ombudsman for the invitation to speak to you today on equality data as a tool for combating discrimination. Disability has long been an exception for the application of human rights and fundamental freedoms. With rights being denied or diminished on the basis of perceived or actual impairment. This denial and diminishment of rights is often seen as benevolent, protective and necessary because of the ableist perception that reduces people with disabilities to objects of care, treatment and protection. This has meant that data collection on disability has focused on diagnosis prevalence and on medical and service recipient status. In other words, it has focused on individual impairment and care, treatment and protection matters. This has resulted in there being a dearth of equality data regarding people with disabilities. 
The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Convention, is the thematic treaty that applies human rights in the context of disability. The standards and principles of the Convention confirm that people with disabilities are subjects of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. This is the purpose of the Convention as outlined in Article 1. The Convention codifies a human rights model of disability. The human rights model of disability requires the recognition that disability is a social construct, that impairment is one aspect of human diversity, and that impairment should never be the basis for the denial or diminishment of human rights. The Convention affirms people with disabilities as subjects of rights and as critical and active participants in law, policy and practice. Importantly, the Convention recognises the diversity of people with disabilities and outlines an intersectional approach to its implementation. Inequality and discrimination are experienced differently depending on how disability intersects with other personal identities and characteristics, such as gender, age, race, Indigenous or LGBTI status. It means that the issues and concerns for people with disabilities need to be specifically recognised, identified and addressed. The Convention represents a significant conceptual shift in how we understand and respond to the phenomenon of disability. And it requires significant, coordinated effort to affect legislative and cultural change to transform society and ensure law, policy and practice promotes, protects and ensures the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all people with disabilities. The objective of the Convention is to combat ableism and disaggregated equality data is critical to this task. There are mechanisms within the Convention that obligate states' parties to develop equality data that is reflective of the lived experience of people with disabilities and that supports and facilitates the implementation of Convention rights. Critical mechanisms are contained in Article 31 of the Convention regarding statistics and data collection and Article 4.3 regarding close consultation and active involvement of people with disabilities through their representative organisations. Article 31 requires states' parties to collect appropriate information, including statistical and research data, to enable them to formulate and implement policies to give effect to the Convention. Data collection needs to be underpinned by safeguards for data protection and respect for privacy. It needs to be disaggregated to respond to the intersectional discrimination and the diversity of people with disabilities. And it needs to be disseminated and ensure accessibility for people with disabilities. Article 31 is a cross-cutting article. This means that states' parties have an obligation to ensure that data collection and analysis is applied in the implementation of all individual rights within the Convention, such as the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to life, to equal recognition before the law, to living independently and being included in the community, the right to education, employment, health and to freedom from torture and ill treatment and exploitation, violence and abuse. In other words, disaggregated equality data needs to be collected and applied to ensure that law, policy and practices frameworks facilitate the implementation of all individual rights for people with disabilities. Article 4.3 requires states' parties to con closely consult with and actively involve people with disabilities 
through their representative organisations in the development and implementation of legislation and policies to implement the Convention and in other decision-making processes concerning our lives. This article responds to the exclusion and marginalisation of people with disabilities from the development of laws, policies and programs and other decision-making processes, which have so often been established on our behalf. Policymakers need to understand the lived experience of disability through close consultation with and active involvement of people with disabilities with the objective of designing, implementing and reviewing policies that can more accurately realise human rights and fundamental freedoms. Together, these articles 31 and 43 provide guidance on addressing ableist approaches to research and data collection, in which experts are privileged and speak on behalf of people with disabilities. People with disabilities should be closely consulted and actively involved in the design, collection, analysis, reporting and dissemination of equality data. This will require mechanisms to be established or enhance to include people with disabilities in data collection processes. For example, are there consultative processes with or advisory bodies of people with disabilities and their representative organisations? Does research funding recognise the added cost of inclusive re research methodologies? Are collaborative research projects with organisations of people with disabilities prioritised? Are research partners required to use inclusive research methodologies? Are people with disabilities through their representative organisations part of research governance? Are their disability human rights indicators incorporated into data recording, collection and reporting? Is the research and evidence gathered by organisations of people with disabilities valued and utilised for equality data? Equality data needs to be underpinned by the principles and standards of the Convention in order to ensure that they provide powerful tools against ableism. Equality data needs to expose the inequality discrimination and segregation experienced by people with disabilities to ensure that human rights violations are identified and adequately and appropriately addressed and that people with disabilities are able to access justice and redress. Disability can no longer be an exception to the application of human rights and fundamental freedoms and equality data is essential to ending this exception. Thank you. So I would like to say thank you, Rosemary, even though she was, uh, she's not here right now uh, for posing quite important questions on research and how we do our research. Um, and now I would like to introduce another keynote speaker that will be joining us digitally, and it's Helena Dali, European Union's Commissioner for Equality. So I hand over to Helena. Dear colleagues, data are a key tool in the fight against structural inequalities and exclusion. We need data for informed policy choices, to know where action is needed, to address the root causes, to know if action is having impact and how to progress further, and to advocate for change and to raise awareness. This is why improving the collection of reliable and comparable equality data, desegregated at national level, is part of our vision to build a union of equality. And it is part of our action to implement our strategies on gender equality, anti-racism, anti-Semitism, LGBTIQ equality, Roma inclusion and the rights of persons with disabilities.
The EU high-level group on non-discrimination, equality and diversity has set up the subgroup on equality data to help member states enhance the collection and use of equality data. Supported by the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, this subgroup has issued guidance on the collection and use of equality data disaggregated by racial or ethnic origin and has compiled good practices across member states. The subgroup is also establishing guidance on the collection and use of data on LGBTIQ equality. I encourage national statistical offices, support services and community organisations to apply this guidance to enhance their own collection and use of data. In 2021, the Commission organised a roundtable on equality data to examine obstacles, exchange good practices and encourage Member States in full respect of their national context to move towards the collection of data disaggregated on the basis of all the relevant discrimination grounds. The objective was to capture both subjective experiences and structural aspects of discrimination. In a world driven by data, we face a lack of data when it comes to equality challenges. We need to fill the gaps in data on violence against women, unpaid family and household work. We have underlined these aspects in our legislative proposal on violence against women, as well as in our care strategy. General statistical data should be disaggregated by characteristics that may put people at risk of discrimination. This includes age beyond 75, disabilities, racial or ethnic origin, sex, gender identity or sexual orientation. Data collection should also allow to identify intersectional aspects of discrimination in line with the approach of our Union of Equality strategies. Finally, in our proposal to reinforce equality bodies, we have addressed their data collection role and the need to strengthen their capacities to build public knowledge about equality. I wish you a fruitful event exploring the significance of equality data for combating discrimination. I thank you.